One of the cool things about Undertaker doing this documentary and being so open in a way that he never allowed himself to be open before is that he gets to make the media rounds and answer questions about things that we've never heard him speak publicly about. Undertaker was the guest on Corey Graves' After the Bell podcast this week to promote the documentary. And there were a few interesting nuggets coming out of this and some other interviews that Undertaker did this week. He confirmed having a conversation or conversations with Kevin Nash many years ago, probably about 20 years ago now, about making the jump to WCW. He said, as much as I was unhappy with our overall creative and we were struggling and it was getting worse and worse. And yeah, a lot of the guys were calling me. I was talking when Kevin Nash was there like, man, I'm pretty sure you could get you some pretty big cheese if you want to come down and do this thing. He said something similar on Sam Roberts' podcast. He said, there was a time that I was so frustrated with our creative direction. We had a bunch of really goofy characters. Meanwhile, WCW was down there doing real angles. Now, when he talks about bad creative and goofy characters, that reeks of 1995. Less so than 96 and 97, it reeks of 1995. Nash didn't go to WCW until 96. And as Nash tells the story, because I've told the story before, Nash has done shoot interviews. He's brought this up before about having a conversation with Mark. And almost, you know, so close, he says, to getting him to come in. I don't know how close he was, but those conversations were closer to like 2000, like 99, 2000. Said he almost got him to come in as biker taker. So if that's the case, then that would be 2000. He said he wouldn't have come in as the dead man. This is Nash now. I'm just telling the Nash story. Nash had said that, yeah, obviously uh, he wouldn't have come in as, as the Undertaker because legally they couldn't do that. But he would have been the biker character that he ended up debuting on WWE television. He would have probably just been Mark Calloway, but he would have been dressed. I don't know if he would have rode a motorcycle, but he would have been very much like the character he debuted in 2000. But the bad storylines and the goofy characters, that is totally 1995. He had a horrible match with King Kong Bundy, which I do not blame The Undertaker for, but he had a horrible match with King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania 11. He worked with Mabel, who caved his eye socket in. He did this angle with Kama, who I know he's very good friends with, but that was the story where he melted the urn down into a chain to wear around his neck. The goofy characters were plentiful that year. By 96, though, he was working with Mankind, his greatest rival, in my opinion. Kane Kane is right there. So is Shawn Michaels. But his greatest rival is Mankind. Uh, 97, he won the championship. He was working with Brett. He was working with Shawn. They introduced Kane. So I don't know about that timeline that The Undertaker was talking about here. His memory is pretty good with these things, so I wish he would have clarified that a little bit more. Uh, But in the end... He said that it was, you know, loyalty. It was loyalty to Vince McMahon and loyalty to the company that kept him where he was. And obviously it paid off in the end. I think he made the right call in hindsight. Undertaker in WCW would have just felt wrong. You know, whatever character he would have portrayed or whatever name he would have used. Maybe they would have gone back to calling him Mean Mark. It just would have felt wrong. Kind of like Sting in WWE. Now, I wish he would have gone sooner and shaved a few years off that TNA run like about 10, before he got too old. But when WCW was still around and you had the war back and forth with the two companies, Sting and WWE, I don't think that would have felt right either. I feel like the people who were WCW fans and Sting fans would have felt the same way that I feel and a lot of people feel about the idea of The Undertaker leaving. It just felt like, how could that be? How could he ever walk away from that character? How could he ever leave? It wouldn't have felt right. You know, Bret Hart did go to WCW, and it never felt right. He never should have gone to WCW. He will tell you he never should have gone to WCW. He did not want to go to WCW. He made great money in WCW. I don't cry for him in that respect. But clearly, Bret Hart has a lot of regrets, as he should, about his time in WCW. Now imagine if Shawn Michaels had gone there. There's a what-if question for you. That would have been an even bigger disaster. 
with all the politics being played, all the egos down there. Can you imagine Shawn Michaels in the state that he was in back then? 97, 96, 97, going to WCW? I mean, for a while, it, it probably would have been pretty cool, and but I don't see how that would have worked. It would have been a complete disaster. Now, Corey Graves also did some name association. He asked about Yokozuna. Undertaker, he took a long pause, so I, I couldn't see him on video. I was listening to the audio of it, uh, so I don't know if he was getting choked up or not. I know he and Yoko were very good friends. They worked a lot together. Hey, remember BSK, the Bone Street crew. Undertaker's even got a BSK tattoo across his stomach. He and Yoko Zuna were part of that little clique. I think they created it. He went to Vince, he says, and personally begged Vince McMahon to let him work with Yoko Zuna. There was one day Yoko, I guess, was working a dark match, and he was there. He watched it, and he said, I want to work with this guy. Please let me work with this guy. And as he's talking to Vince McMahon, down the hallway, who should come walking down the hallway? But the giant Gonzalez. And Vince McMahon says, oh, you'll work with him, but you're going to work with that guy first. <laughs> Undertaker turned around and saw, here comes Giant Gonzalez, all seven foot seven, seven foot six, whatever he was. And Undertaker laughed because one of the reasons he left WCW in the first place was because they wanted him to work with Eligante, which is what the Giant Gonzalez was called in WCW. And now here he is, he says, following me. He's following me from the other company. You're killing me here. And they truly did. Undertaker, I, I, I sympathize with him because they truly had horrible matches together. They only had two television matches. I don't know if they worked on uh, house shows or anything. But, you know, WrestleMania 9 and the whole chloroform finish and then the rest in peace match at SummerSlam back in 93. They were horrible. And I don't blame Undertaker for that at all. Mark Calloway is not a miracle worker. He might be an Undertaker, but he's not a miracle worker. What could he do? What could he do with Giant Gonzalez? Nothing. There was nothing that he could do. On the greatest wrestling match ever, between Edge and Randy Orton at Backlash, Undertaker told Corey Graves that the match almost brought a tear to his eye. What a story they told. He said that he sent a text message to Edge, telling him the next time that he visits the PC to work with some of the guys down there, he's going to pull that tape up and show it to them and dissect it, all the little things about it that they did. He talked about how athletic the current talent roster is, but it means very little, he says, when all you rely on is your athleticism. He says eventually fans get desensitized to the double backflip off the top rope onto somebody on the floor. You push the envelope and that brings a higher risk for injury. He said that the match between Edge and Randy Orton needs to be studied even by the main roster talent. And it's everything professional wrestling is supposed to be. Now look, he's not wrong about the point about relying on just your athleticism. You need good stories. I mean, you need to... We, we talked about this before, right? We And we hear wrestlers talk about it all the time. As fans, when we watch the show, everybody has different uh, tastes for what they watch wrestling for, but... You know, it's not enough to just be a good wrestler or have flashy moves, right? You probably want the person, ideally, to be able to talk. That would be nice. You want good stories, which is not always in the control of the talent. The company has to work with the talent. The company has to either ha come up with the stories or okay story ideas. And <laughs> some of these stories are not always the greatest. And it could actually hurt the talent and not help the talent. But you need good stories to get you to those big matches. I don't think he's saying anything earth-shattering here, but I could see those comments shattering some fragile egos behind the scenes. I don't think he was being dismissive of the current roster, but he was offering some valid criticism of wrestling today in general. Here's something else I agree with him on. From an interview that he did with ComicBook.com, he was asked if he thinks wrestlers should go back to protecting their characters like he did. Or is that just not possible at this point? He said, I've had this conversation a lot with Vince McMahon, with Shawn Michaels, and with Triple H. He says, I can't remember who. I think it might have been Triple H used the analogy, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. That being said, I do think that 
the rain should be pulled back a little bit. I think due to the amount of, number one, the amount of content and the couple that with the amount of social media that our talent does. It is just hard for me to see guys on TV trying to be one thing. And then they're on their personal social media pages and they're something completely different. It is such a huge disconnect for me. Obviously, I'm not saying that the way I did things was absolutely the right way to do it. It was the right way for me to do it. And I think that's a good point. The kind of character The Undertaker had, you can totally understand why he would have been so protective and wanting to keep kayfabe and not be seen out of character. And it, because that was such a unique character, you wanted people to actually be afraid of The Undertaker, little kids to be afraid of The Undertaker, people to buy into the darker aspects of the character. You know, if you were walking down the street in 1994 and you saw Mark Calloway walking down with, you know, wearing some kind of smiley face t-shirt with a fucking pink bow in his hair, all of a sudden you're not so afraid of The Undertaker anymore. So he felt that he had to live the gimmick. He had to live the character. That may not be the case with everybody. The way that Undertaker treated his character might be different than the way Ricochet. You know, Ricochet might do things a little bit different than The Undertaker did. Anyway, he continued. He said, but I think there's more of a, and this is just my thoughts, he said, but there's more of an emphasis on the talents putting on their social media, what they're putting on their social media than what they are putting into their characters and doing on TV. And I think that's a big disconnect with the audience. I think that they should pump the brakes a little bit on the outside stuff and figure out what it is that they are and what they're going to do on TV because really that's what people are watching. It is such a weird world now that everybody wants to know everything that's going on behind the scenes and that's great, but just because they want it doesn't mean they necessarily need to get it. They don't need to get everything. There needs to be some sense of mystery, some mystique. Again, I, I think he's bang on. We know too much. I think we could all admit that. We know too much. And it's not just newsletters and websites. Newsletters and wrestling news websites have been around for a few decades now. You know, the earliest wrestling news websites go back to the the mid-90s. The newsletters go back to at least the early 80s. That's been around. But wrestlers being as accessible as they are, you know, posting fo- like it, it's social media. That's really what it boils down to. That was the game changer here. Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram and YouTube. Yeah, you can put YouTube in there. But like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and platforms like that, that changed the whole ball game. In some ways for the better, in a lot of ways for the worse. Especially with Twitter. Wrestlers now, they're, they're completely accessible. Posting photos out of character, answering questions, they've pulled the curtain back. Even guys who never would have been caught dead on social media, like The Undertaker. Caught dead, no pun intended. But now The Undertaker, who's mostly retired anyway, he's on Twitter and he's on Instagram and, you know, Dean Ambrose for years. Remember the, the first tweet he ever posted? They forced me to set this up and then he never used it. And I kind of like that, the fact that he would not be on social media. Well, now John Moxley, he's, on, he's actually on social media quite a bit. And again, I kind of like it, but I also respected the fact that for so long he resisted. They made him set one up and he never used it. And you know what? There was a sense of mystery around the guy. What's he like outside the ring? He seems like a crazy person. You would hear stories from his wife. But rarely would you see Moxley posting on social media. But we're seeing more and more people get who would not have done this before now getting involved on social media. And it does kill some of the mystique. Absolutely. Without question. The problem is you can't unring that bell. Or, or as he says, put the toothpaste back into the tube. I like that analogy as well. By the way, have you ever put toothpaste back into the tube? The answer is no, you haven't, because it's not possible. <laughs> Believe me, I've tried. It's not possible. But I do think it has killed a lot of the mystique. I I'm also not eight years old anymore. Let's just be honest here. I don't know how many of you became fans as a kid. Some of you may have become big wrestling fans when you were a teenager. Maybe you're only a new fan to the business. and You're, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s. Not everybody is a kid when they first become a wrestling fan. I was. I was five years old. That's when my fandom dates back to. But I'm not five years old. I'm not eight years old. I'm not 12 years old anymore. The older you get, naturally, the more inquisitive that you get about the goings-on behind the scenes and 
wanting to learn more about the, the personas on TV. Now you have reality shows that take you behind the scenes, Total Divas, Total Bellas. Tough Enough. Tough Enough goes back to 2000, where they were pulling back the curtain and showing you things that you would never have seen previously. But it's funny, like, imagine if a lot of those guys from the 80s and the 90s were on Twitter back then, right? Imagine Macho Man Randy Savage on Twitter. Undertaker back then on Twitter. The Freebirds on Twitter. The Horsemen on Twitter. Some things are better left to the imagination. Speaking of things being left to the imagination, that is the perfect segue that I did not plan. He was asked the million-dollar question. In this interview on comicbook.com, not by Corey Graves. What do you say to the fans who, to this day, still hold out hope for a match between you and Sting? This is what The Undertaker had to say. He says, in this world, you never say never. Spoken like a true wrestler. You never say never, but I think as great as it sounds on paper, and it does, I mean, obviously that's a super marquee match, right? But where I kind of differ from a lot of people is I look past the marquee value and I look at the ability to deliver. So like you said, there's so many people who are clamoring for that match that I just don't know the match would deliver on people's expectations. And the only reason I say that, he says I take full responsibility. I don't have the mobility or the same skill set I once did that I need to make that match great. It's better left to the theater of the mind to actually put it out there, and then with the expectations being so high and the match not delivering, it would be a bigger disappointment than the match never happening at all. Ten years ago, I think it still could have happened and it could have been a stellar match. I'm just not sure at this point that it could ever deliver on the hype. And then he was asked, I know there were rumors of the match floating around WrestleMania 27, Has there ever been a time where it was seriously considered or discussed? He said, not to my knowledge. I know the temperature got turned up on that, and I don't remember which mania it was, but Sting and I were on the same flight after a WrestleMania, and that, by the way, was after WrestleMania 31. After Raw that Monday, the Raw after WrestleMania, they were photographed together, chatting briefly at the airport, so that's what he's talking about. He said, we were standing in line together and talking on somebody, obviously, in this day and age. Everybody has a camera, and somebody uh, snapped a picture as we were just having a casual conversation. No one ever approached me with anything serious, like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about working with Sting? Or it's never been presented to me by anyone other than our fans. So there it is. That is The Undertaker's claim as to why the match with Sting never happened. A, he was never approached about the idea anyway. But B, at this stage, or in the last few years, he feels physically he just would not be able to keep up the way that he would want to keep up. And I think he's got too much respect to say something like that about Sting. But the reality is Sting is even older than The Undertaker. Sting is older by about five or six years. Sting's already in his 60s. Now, back then, WrestleMania 27, what was that, 2011? He wasn't. You know, he would have been early 50s. But Sting is older, and look, Sting is a little slower, and he's not the Sting that he used to be either. And Undertaker is, is, has too much respect to, to say that, but it goes both ways. You know, it's not just the Undertaker who isn't what he once was. You could say the same thing about Sting. And so I've always wondered if he was concerned about that as well. Not just himself, but... In his mind, feeling, if I'm going to go in there and do something, unless it's just something fun, like with my friends, like what they did in Saudi Arabia, him and Kane against Sean and Triple H, and what a fucking disaster that was. Unless it's something like that, that he just thinks would be fun. I could see him wanting to, you know, do a match with somebody who's younger and faster and who can bump around and really carry the load and make that thing as good as it can possibly be and work around his limitations. Sting does not qualify. Sting does not qualify as a more spry, faster, younger talent who's going to go in there and that he can, in his mind, say, okay, I trust that this guy is going to help me, you know, along here and we're not going to end up looking like fools. I just think he, again, he doesn't want to say that. 
But it boils down to him just feeling they couldn't live up to the hype. And the reality is, he's right. He's right. The only way at this point that you could do Sting and The Undertaker, and even, even something like a cinematic match, if Sting is not medically cleared, I don't know that he would even be allowed to do that. He, he'd still have to take bumps. I mean, you know, he's got to do something. But if he could get cleared for a cinematic style match, similar to the Boneyard match that he did with AJ at WrestleMania, that I think at this stage, if you wanted to do it, it absolutely would have to be a cinematic style match or a fight scene, really, is what is what that was. It wasn't a match. It was a fight scene. A Sting Undertaker fight scene like what he did with AJ at WrestleMania, I think, could be tremendous. I think that absolutely could work. In the ring? Absolutely not. Undertaker is 100% right. That ship sailed long ago when they did not do the match at WrestleMania 31. That was their shot. They didn't take it, and that was it. They missed their mark. They missed their mark. But cinematically, I still think if they wanted to do that, that would be a workable scenario. But anyway, Chapter 5 is out now on the network. Again, I'm going to be watching it as soon as I'm done here. And I hope you'll join me for my review on the channel Tuesday night at 8 p.m.